Anybody who follows Rick Warren or that whole ideology is doing so because
dumb ass speaking with that voice for bad than that is the problem. Verse 17 is what I have up on the screen. These are wells without water. Clouds, that's what we're studying, the clouds of the day of the Lord, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Now, if you add that then to Jude, verse 12, he said, these are spots. And that's what Peter said. They're spots on your beast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Then he said, clouds they are without water. The clouds that we are blessed by have water in them. And that water distills and comes down on us and feeds us like grass. And we grow thereby. The sun shines on us. Again, but of corruptible yes. see, 
that you can continue on in this body, living in this kind of life, and just get better, better, better as days go by. And I want out of this world whenever God wants me to get out of this world. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 25, 14. That years ago, I, I was looking, I was searching. So I went to a Pentecostal church in this area.
Check. You can hear that one? All right. We'll just make this work, all right? So anyway, let's get back to the Bible. Yeah. No, go ahead. That's the blessing. It's called the blessing of Spock. <laughs> the, um, the rabbi will do that. He'll hold his hands like that. And that's the blessing that the rabbi gives at the synagogue. Okay? That's not in the Bible. Okay? And that's where Leonard Nimoy got it. When he was a boy, he was, he was Jewish. And he saw that in the synagogue. And that's where he, he wanted something like a greeting for the Vulcans, and yeah. Anyway, uh, Hebrew roots, people, I love you guys. I'm glad that God brought you out of the law into his wonderful law of liberty, okay? Matthew 24. This is the sign of the Son of Man coming. The uh, Watchman video I just did is called Great Tribulation. And what I did was, I did this several years ago, I decided that I would study the word tribulation or tribulation, see what the Bible said. Because I knew what I had been taught, and I knew, you know, what preachers preached and things like that, and I wasn't just trying to come up with something different, but what I read was something different than what I'd heard, okay? And I just, I'm going to encourage you to do that. And you'll end up being dangerous if you're going to if you're going to say I believe what this Bible says and only what this Bible says. Then believe it and believe every word of it. You may not understand it and we're not going to see it right until it actually happens. But we believe it. OK, so in Matthew 24, he speaks of the tribulation of those days. All right. And I don't have a problem believing that we, through much tribulation, must enter into the kingdom of God. I don't have a problem believing that. Um, we're appointed for that. So he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Uh, hold that place and go to uh, Revelation chapter 6. Turn there. Revelation 6. Verse 12. Now I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Six is a number for preparation. In Genesis chapter 6, what did Noah do? He prepared the ark. Um, when the law was given concerning the Sabbath day, when they gathered manna, and we read it earlier, it specifically said that on the sixth day, they were to gather a double portion and prepare it. They were to, they were to prepare the manna on the sixth day so that they would not violate the Sabbath in doing work on the Sabbath day. Which means that they pounded the meal and made their cakes and had it ready so that on the Sabbath day they would not have to labor in it. They were, they were to rest. So six is a number for preparation. All right. So you have the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. 
And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Turn to Acts chapter 2. You don't mind turning all these places in your Bible, do you? Ah. Oh. Acts chapter 2. The day of the Lord. Verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, you young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Four things happen here. Sons and daughters prophesy, young men see visions, old men dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I shall show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapors of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. That's exactly what we saw in Revelation chapter 6, at the uh, opening of the sixth seal. So if we go back to Revelation 6, um, Peter just told us, that that happens before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So Revelation chapter 6, again, uh, the sixth seal, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Because remember, God said that when he rises up again, he's going to shake the earth, and heaven as well. God's going to shake heaven just like a wind would shake a fig tree. And when he shakes it, figs are going to fall out. But these figs are stars. And what are those stars? Angels, devils, little g, gods, evil angels. They're going to be shaken out of heaven, cast out. How many of them? A third of them, because we know there's a war in heaven. Michael fighting with the dragon and his angels. And the dragon takes his tail and one third of the stars and casts them down to the earth. All right? This, this is that. So verse 14. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men and the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens, the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and, and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? We go back to Matthew 24 verse 29. I have it up on the screen. The, moon sh the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So Matthew 24, Acts chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. I could add in here Isaiah 13, Revelation 6, and other places. They're all speaking of the same event. The same thing is happening here. Sun darkened. Moon turning to blood. The stars, are, the heavens are going to be shaken. The earth is going to shake. The stars are going to fall. And by the way, the things of the earth, when God shakes them, they're going to fall as well. So the question is, will you? No. Because you know what you're going to do? You're going to take heed. Lest ye fall. Amen? You're going to take heed. And you're going to be grounded and rooted and settled. And your house is going to be built upon the rock. So even though the heavens and the earth shake, you are still standing. Amen. The image of the beast revealed. And the music's going to play. And everybody's going to fall on that day. There should be a falling away 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 1st. Okay? Falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Don't fall. Keep standing. Have your loins girt about with truth. Helmet of salvation. Breastplate of righteousness. Shield of faith. 
feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and having done all to stand in the evil day. Because the evil day is coming. Amen? And who shall abide it? But those who stand by the grace of God through faith. Amen? You believe the word. Amen? So when all that happens, verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming where? In the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and they shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's what we saw back in Exodus 19. There was the sound of the trumpet exceeding loud, and an earthquake and lightnings and thunderings, and then the Lord descended in the cloud. And Moses went up to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? It's all there. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And I've covered this issue about who the elect is. The elect is whoever God elected. Okay? Are there Jews who are part of the elect? Yes. Are there Gentiles? Yes. We, are, we have been elected from God, by God from before the foundation of the world. God elected us. God chose us. We are, we are to make our calling and election sure. Okay? Now, Mark chapter 14, verse 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses witness against, or these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Amen. When he brings that cloud, remember, Christ is going to be there for you. We've had times in this church and last since y'all were here last year where clouds were over some people's lives, very dark clouds, some pretty rough times. And in every one of them, the Lord was there. In every one of them, he was helping his people. In every one of those situations, there was something that God was teaching them throughout all of that. Something about themselves or maybe something about other people or just something about how good God really is to us and we don't deserve it. God was there the whole time teaching us great and mighty things. Amen? So we're going to see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. Acts chapter 1, turn there. Wish I had a like a chain, you know, like in the fifties when the TV guys would be on TV. They didn't. They had lapel mics that were this big, and they were held on by a chain. You remember those days? Okay. Now we got these little ditty things, huh? No, I'm fine. Because I feel like Bob Barker with this thing. I need one about that long. Okay. Yeah, a little skinny microphone. The only, the only kind of microphone I don't like is those the one that come out of your ear like this and they come right there. And I, keep, I always want to look at it. Just keep going. Okay? I don't like those. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. We had spoken these things. While they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Wouldn't you be steadfastly going... By the way, there's a balloon up there. I don't know if you noticed that or not. <laughs> a cloud received him out of their sight, and while they steadfa looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. 
When he comes, he's coming in the clouds. When you see the cloud, just remember, he's going to be in that cloud. First Thessalonians 4 says it. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. I mean, God just keeps emphasizing this over and over and over again. Telling us the sign of his appearing. It's going to be in the clouds. Now, uh, you know, I, again, I don't know exactly how this is going to work. But it seems to me that. The Bible keeps emphasizing this, maybe because when the Antichrist appears, maybe there is the absence of cloud. And just maybe, God's people are going to look, and the world's going to say, oh, that's the Messiah, that's Jesus, or that's the Christ, or that's whatever. And God's people are going to recognize that it's not him. And we're going to say, uh uh, that's the man of sin. That's not the son of righteousness. That's the man of sin. Okay? Now, you just might get your head cut off for that. Bring it on. Amen? Bring it on. It'll only hurt for a couple seconds. Right? Okay. Exodus 19, you know, I've, I've covered that. Yeah, amen. Exodus 34. This is when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and Moses rose up early in the morning, went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. I look at that and I see the church. We are the tables of stone. Moses carved us out and he's going to take us up into heaven so God can write his law on, on us and in us. So, and then he comes back down with those tables with the law written on them. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's what I see in that. And so in verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. You're seeing a picture of it right here. And then uh, in verse 10, and he said, behold, I make a covenant. So the purpose of the clouds and the day of the Lord is God initiating the new covenant that he promised in Jeremiah 31 with the people of Israel. He's now coming to establish that second covenant, that new covenant that's not like the covenant of Mount Sinai. The Hebrew roots people say, well, it's the renewed covenant. They want everybody to think that we're supposed to go back to Mount Sinai. I'm not going backwards. My covenant with God is not that I promise to keep the law. I've tried that and failed every time. What I can do is believe what God said and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a new covenant, a different one. And that's the one. I've, I've heard that guys like John Hagee teach that the Messiah is going to come and restore animal sacrifices for the people of Israel. And that's their salvation. I don't go, I don't believe in that. To kill a goat when you already have the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I just don't, I don't know where these guys get that stuff, but it ain't, it ain't Bible. Amen. Joel chapter 2, let's turn there. Even while I uh, put these notes together, I, n I never fail to learn something new that I n didn't know before. I love the work of laboring in the Word because even while I am putting something together to teach to God's people, whether it be here at Bethel or wherever, 
Uh, I myself always learn something that I never knew before, never thought of before from the Bible, something I never saw before. And that was the case here in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 is the day of the Lord. That's what it's about. And he says, blow you the trumpet in Zion. So there's the connection with the trumpet. Blow you the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. There it is, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. It is a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, now watch this, a, pe a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now again, you have people like Todd Bentley and multitudes of others who claim that they are God's mighty army from the book of Joel. Uh, Todd Bentley even has a tattoo, which you ought not have. God said, don't get them. God said, don't print marks on your skin. Now, why did God say that? You know, I don't know. But I'm pretty sure he had a good reason for it. Why did my mom tell me not to jump on the bed? Does she not know how fun that is? I wasn't going to get hurt. But she had a good reason. God told us not to get those things printed on our skin. Okay? Yeah, without spot. Now, I don't think having a tattoo when God's... I don't think God's going to say, well, you got a tattoo, you can't be saved. But God said don't do it. So maybe, just maybe, something is linked to the mark in your right hand or forehead linked to God saying, don't print marks on your skin. Maybe that's why God said that. Yes. Body's a temple. Okay. And it doesn't need a coat of paint or graffiti. Amen. Okay. Anyway, God said don't do it, so don't do it. Amen. But anyway, he's got tattoos right here in the form of dog tags, and it says Joel's army on it. Right here at his neck. He's very proud about this. And they teach that they are Joel's mighty army. We're going to take over the world for Jesus Christ. We're going to be superheroes. We are a new breed. Does he look like a horse? Okay, I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, these look like horses. Okay? And the thing is, Kevin, these people, are, they are so serious about this. But they're teaching... That at some point, the Holy Ghost is going to change all of their DNA. So that's going to turn them into these super breed of super Christians. And I'm going, that's a setup. Okay? So look. A great people and a strong, there have not ever been the like. And I was looking at that phrase and I went, because I had just read Numbers 13 and 14 again. I had just read it. And then I went back to studying this out, and it says great people in the strong. And I remembered that that is exactly what the spies came back from the land of Canaan and said about the Canaanites. Look at Numbers 13. Open your Bible up there. Underline these phrases. Numbers 13, 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell there. That's what Joel said about the people, the army, that's in the book of Joel and the book of Revelation. The people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled, very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And then down in verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel. An evil report is the opposite of the gospel. Uh, Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report. It's about Christ on the cross. So here they bring an evil report. The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. 
So they are a great and a strong people, and that's exactly how Joel described the army, a great people and a strong. I think numbers is a foreshadowing of Joel's army. Okay? And I think that God is wanting to give us a helmet of salvation and a shield of faith and a breastplate of righteousness and all that stuff because there's a battle to fight. A war that we're going to be in. Male, female, young and old. We're going to have to fight a war and we're going to have to stand our ground in it. And who are we fighting? A great people and a strong. That's who we're going to fight. Turn to Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog. You know, there's a legend in London that the city of London was founded by two giants named Gog and Magog. It's the truth. And they are the, like the spirits of the city of London. Yeah, <laughs> Ezekiel thirty-eight fourteen. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know of it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Joel's army comes, it's the northern army. In Jeremiah, God warned many times about an evil cometh out of the north. Had to have been speaking about Canada. Right? But we, this is the first year we don't have any Canadians here. Dun, dun, dun. Huh? French Canadian. Your grandfather's name was Guy, right? <laughs> anyway. Thou shalt uh, come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, think about this for a minute. How many armies are there in the world right now that still ride on horses? Even in the American army, they call it like, you know, the fourth ca ca cavalry, cavalry, and they don't ride horses. Okay, they still call it, huh? Helicopters, yeah, there you go, okay. So, this is Bible prophecy, right? Does the Bible mean what the Bible says? Yes. So, what does that say about this particular army? When it says, they're going to be riding upon horses. It means exactly what it says. Now think about when we return with Christ. How are we coming back? Riding on horses. And you, and you know, uh, let's see, Revelation 6 and who said spiritual army? Okay, which means an army of spirits. Turn to uh, Zechariah. Chapter, let's see, I think it's six. Yeah. Zechariah chapter six, verse one. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains. The mountains were mountains of brass. The first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled and bay. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel answered and said unto me, These are the four what? Spirits of the heavens. Okay? So, again, think Bible when it comes to this, and think Ezekiel 38 is not talking about Russia. Okay? 
even though there might be a Russian element to that, they may be using the people of Russia, but the real army that God is speaking of here is an army of spirits, evil, very evil, bad spirits that God has been holding back all of this time. And in the day of the Lord, he's going to turn them loose. And they're going to go and do very bad, evil, terrible things on this earth. And there isn't a weapon in the world that can stop them because they are spirits and not flesh. Okay? That makes them way more dangerous than the Russians. Way more dangerous. A mighty army. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a what? Cloud to cover the land. There it is. The day of the Lord is a day of clouds. This army comes out as a cloud to cover the land. But just remember. God says, when I bring the cloud over the land, what are you going to see there? The bow. And that's my sign, my covenant, my token. That I'm going to keep my promise. I am going to keep my word. Uh, one more passage and then we'll get into your questions. Jeremiah chapter 4, Deuteronomy 28, Jeremiah 4, 7, the lion has come up from his thicket, the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way, Abaddon, Apollyon, okay, the destroyer. Of the Gentiles on his way. And he has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate. And thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Boy, think about that. Is that really going to happen? You better believe it is. And then verse 13. Behold, he shall come up as clouds. There it is. So here we have Jeremiah 4. And we have Ezekiel 38. You could even make a case that Joel references it. But this very evil army comes as clouds, as a cloud to cover the land. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. Again, this is a spirit army, an army of ghosts, an army of devils. The, the, he says his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. How did Elijah go to heaven? Chariots of fire and horses of fire, and he and there was a whirlwind there. It's the same thing. Uh, and when you go to um, Ezekiel chapter one, in the description of those four living creatures, that's what you see. They are the chariot of God. And there was a, a whirlwind of fire enfolding itself as it approached from what direction? The north. Came from the north. Okay? And that was where, where God comes from anyway. Uh, and then last, last place, he says, uh, He shall come up as clouds, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us for we are spoiled. Deut Deuteronomy 28, that's what it says. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. As swift as the eagle flieth. A nation that speaks in tongues. Right? A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Um, they pulled the plug on the Facebook AI. Remember that? Because they started, the computers started talking to one another in a language that the programmers and the engineers were going, what is that? We don't understand that. But apparently, the computers did understand it. And I'm just going, that's scary, freaky, science fiction stuff. And here uh, on Drudge Report today, Elon Musk, the guy that owns Tesla and SpaceX and all these companies, he's again warning against artificial intelligence and saying, everybody right now is afraid of North Korea. I'm telling you that artificial intelligence represents a far greater threat to mankind than mankind himself does. And literally, we as a civilization are building 
a God to rule over us. We're doing it right now by way of artificial... And I don't know exactly how artificial intelligent computers and these devils, I don't know how they're going to sync together or how it's going to be formed up or whatever. But I'm just telling you, this stuff is real. All the movies that I ever saw where the computers got smart, it never turned out good for us. We lost every time, amen. Okay? But just, and just remember, the image that they make of the beast has the ability to speak independent of anything programming it to speak. It has the ability to speak and it makes a decision. An image, a statue, makes a decision that everybody has to worship it, and if you don't, you're killed. Never before in the history of mankind, with all the idols and images that man has made, not a one of them has ever made a decision to kill people. Not a one of them has ever spoken independently. It's not like the Wizard of Oz is standing in the background, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, okay? This image is both dead and alive. When you process that, let me know. Okay? All right. When the cloud comes. When the cloud comes, people, look for the bow. Okay? When you leave out of here and things aren't going well and you're scared, just look for the bow in the cloud. Amen? Let's do some questions and answers. Who in here is named Michigan? The Michigan group. What, if any, are the differences between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? The, answer, the biblical answer is they are the same. Now, I know, I know... That dispensationalism teaches that they're different. And I've heard these guys talk. They say, well, they're the same, but they're different. No, it doesn't. And, and I'm not going to get into why I'm not a dispensationalist, okay? But I prom um, there's a verse. It's in Matthew, I know, because the only place in the whole Bible you're going to find the phrase kingdom of heaven is in the book of Matthew. There's a passage, somebody find it if you want to, in the book of Matthew where it mentions the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in the same place, telling you they are the same thing. And if you do a line upon line study of every place in the Bible where the phrase kingdom of heaven is found, which is going to be in Matthew, and look at the other gospels, the parallels that where, where Matthew would say kingdom of heaven, Mark and Luke say kingdom of God. And it's in the same story, the same line, the same quotation. All right? Now, I don't know why Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven and the other gospels call it the kingdom of God. I don't know why. Okay? But the explanation that I've heard from dispensationalists is that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of this flesh and of this earth. That in itself doesn't make sense either. I don't follow it. Because I've read all the places in Matthew where it says kingdom of heaven and not one time did I see anything like their description of it. So I looked at it independent of websites and commentaries and books and I cannot see a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Okay. Yeah, and they'll, they'll argue till they are red-faced over it, but they never supply any scripture that says, here, right here, the Bible clearly says the kingdom of heaven is this, whereas the kingdom of God is that. They, they never supply that scripture. Who found it?
What chapter? Okay. Huh? Chapter Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. Okay, repent for the kingdom of heaven. There's a place. Okay, that sounds right. Matthew 19, 23 and 24. Turn there in your Bible. Okay. Then Jesus uh, said, Jesus unto disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They're the same. Okay, and I can't I can't get past that. I can't biblically say, but according to Luke so and so or First Corinthians whatever, I can't say biblically that there is a distinction between them. Okay, and part of that teaching is that Jesus preached, or there were two gospels, which I have a huge problem with. One gospel for Israel where it's the kingdom that's on this earth and another gospel for the Gentiles where we get to inherit heaven. That is not biblical. And I am told by Paul to not accept any other gospel. I'm not to preach it. I'm not to listen to it. If any man bring any other gospel, let him be accursed. Okay? People, there's one gospel. There's one, Jesus died one way for Jews and Gentiles forever. Amen? And no difference between them. All right. And anyway. All right. John, let's see here. Here is John chapter 5, verse 4. Who is the angel that troubled the water at a certain season who made them whole? Was it the man's faith that made him whole? John chapter 5. Turn there. The angel that troubled the water was Anne. It's Anne, angel. For an angel went down at a certain season <laughs> into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Okay, the question is, who is the angel? Well, it, it doesn't say. It does not say the name of the angel or whatever. Okay? Uh, incidentally, this portion is taken out of the new translations. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I accept that. Okay? I believe that there was an angel that came down and troubled the water. Okay? Now, the question is, um, who made them whole? Was the man's faith, was it the man's faith that made them whole? Yes, because this angel comes down. God sends this angel down, trouble the water. And everybody knows that whoever gets into that water first is healed of a disease. So an angel comes down and troubles the water. Now, you either believe or you don't. If you don't believe that in getting in that water, you're going to be healed, what do you do? You don't get in the water. You just go... I ain't falling for that. Okay? But if you believe it, what do you do? You try to get there. This man couldn't get there. He said, I have nobody to put me in. Jesus said, well, I'll heal you. And he healed him. Amen? It's still faith. And this gets into the, uh, in the book of James. Is it faith that saves us or works that saves us? It's faith because faith produces the works. Amen? I'm going to say, I'm going to say this phrase. I love the King James Bible. Amen. See? You believe it, and you reacted to it. If you don't believe it, you're sitting there going, I'm sick of that King James stuff. <laughs> right? So when, when James is talking about faith and works, Rahab the harlot believed those two witnesses. If she didn't believe them, she would have turned them in. But she believed them. 
And it was her faith that wrought her works. And that saved her. And that's what James is saying. You show me your faith without your works. You say you believe, but everything that you do in life testifies against you. You don't really believe. But you say you believe and then you act according to that belief. That testifies that you really do believe. All right. All right. Let's see what else here. Let's see here. Ooh, I see one here. That's going to be tricky. Uh, is there a difference between the AV, KJV, and AKJV? AV means authorized version. KJV means King James Version. AKJV means authorized King James Version. They're all the same. Okay? Um, now, there is a difference between the Cambridge edition and the Oxford edition. We use the Cambridge edition. Okay? I trust it. Okay? I'm not sure why Oxford has to be different. I'm not sure. There's, it's a difference in a few words. Okay, it's not much, but it is a difference, all right? So we use the, the Cambridge. Most of the King James Bibles that you're going to get are going to be Cambridge, especially in this country. Except for the Takata. I'm going to look into that, but apparently the Takata uses the Cambridge, or the Oxford. Oxford, okay? All right, boy, this is a good, this is a tricky one here. Last year, my job required me to give a DNA swab sample that would be entered into a national database. There was not much notice. It made me feel kind of sick inside, but I didn't see to do it was against Scripture, so I complied. I still wonder about it. As technology and man's knowledge increases, how, many, um, how may we correctly discern and choose wisely when that important decision may come at a moment's notice? Well, here's how I'll answer that, Okay. Uh, I think that goes along with Jesus when he was saying they shall take you up before the synagogues and they shall take you up before kings and rulers. Give no thought to what you're going to say. For I will give you the words. Okay? And I think if it's life, eternal life critical, God is never going to, to allow you to just follow your gut and get it wrong, okay? And I, I make a lot out of this, but to me it's so simple. When Israel was in the wilderness, as wicked as they were, they never moved an inch until the cloud moved. And God made it that way. When they got up in the morning and they saw that cloud over the tabernacle, that was to them saying, go about your business. They wake up the next morning and that cloud's over on the next field. God's going to wait for them over there, but they all know, pack your stuff up, let's get in line in the order that God said, we're moving today. And God would wait for them to do what he told them to do to get in line, then he would lead them. And I think following God really is that simple. And it, again, what is it? It's waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. But I really think, folks, that when it comes down to some of the decisions that we might have to make in our lifetime, I think that God is not going to let us go astray. He's the shepherd, right? All he's got to do is tap us real hard with that rod and that staff, right? And we'll know. All right, here's, boy, this, here's another one here. Um... As we enjoy watching uh, good teachings, music, etc. on TV, our computer, our smartphone, new information is coming out on patents for things like RF, which I think is radio frequency. It shows the design was to control our neural transmitters. How do we know to protect attacks on our mind, body, spirit from things we are exposed to every day willingly? Again, now, I don't know about anything like that, okay? I'm not saying it's true. I'm not saying it's not true. It's just that I've never really seen any credible evidence that radio, there's radio frequencies in this room all over the place, okay? I haven't seen any credible evidence that says that that affects our neurotransmitters and it's causing people to do bad things. People do bad things because they're wicked, hell-deserving, they're depraved in their nature and their heart's desperately wicked. 
That's why we make the stupid decisions that we make. Okay? It's not radio frequencies. It's not, you know, stuff pinging off the cell towers making us do stupid stuff. Okay? It's, we're full of it. All right? I don't, I also know as a believer, I'm not worried because Jesus promised us that it's not possible to deceive the truly or very elect. Okay? I don't worry about stuff like that. I don't worry about mind control techniques that they're planning on controlling the masses to make them all go get in line for the beast and somehow that's going to affect us. I'm not worried about that. My shepherd is there to protect me from that. Okay? So, it, and even if you don't watch your computer screen or your TV screen, everywhere you go in this country, there's radio waves all around you, except for when you really need to make a phone call, all right? Um, concerning Luke 21:36, how can we best watch... Uh, practical steps so that we may be good watchmen and correctly warn others not with disinformation well you know me you know that I think there is a lot of junk on the internet posing as prophecy there's a lot of a lot of misinformation there's stuff out now about this eclipse it's going to bring in the tribulation. It's going to bring in the mark of the beast. It's going to start wars. It's going to do this. They do this stuff every time something up there pops up. Okay? A comet goes by, and all of a sudden, that's a spaceship, and, you know, NASA knows it, and they're not telling us, and, and all this stuff. And I look at that stuff, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to repeat that nonsense. I don't know that it's true, okay? And when, when you start passing around junk from the internet to everybody you know, and it all turns out to be phony, you are ruining your chance to give them the gospel and have them believe it. People, please... You've heard me say enough. If it's not in the Bible, don't believe it. Okay? If you want to warn people about what's going on, go through the scriptures, find some really good verses, put them in an email, and send them to people. And say, I love you. Read this. This is what God said. But if you don't know 100% from the internet that it's 100% factual true, don't repeat it. Okay? Uh, let's see here. <laughs> How does a Christian advise a fellow quote unquote Christian who is gay, who has been to Bible college, hates the king? Listen, at least three guys that I went to Bible college with are sodomites. I know it for a fact. Okay. You, we suspected it then, right? Okay. But, and I, you know, when I first got on Facebook, I went around friending people that I went to Bible college with. And one of them, he was a former Mormon missionary, and he was going to church and going to, going to Bible college to learn how to be a preacher and all this stuff. And we were friends for a while and lost track of him. Anyway, I get back on Facebook and I friend him, and then I start looking at his pictures and I'm going... He's gay. You know, some people just gay, right? And then he came out in support of some gay thing or something like that. And I wrote him and I said, what happened to you? You weren't like this in college. He wrote back, he said, oh, yes, I was. Okay. Listen, they're everywhere. Uh, anyway, that says, who lives the lifestyle but believes it all comes under God's grace. Listen. When, I don't care, gay or not. 
when your lifestyle and you actively apologize your lifestyle, and apologize means you're proving it to be right, when you purposely vindicate your lifestyle choices, and they are obviously sin, you're not saved. The Holy Spirit convicts people of sin and causes them to repent and live repentance, live sorrowful over their sins. There's things I've repented of a hundred times if I've done it once. Knowing that God has forgiven me, yet still repenting over that sin, over things I did. That's the evidence that the Holy Ghost is in your life. But someone who just actively pursues the same slop that God calls us out of with no repentance, only saying, God made me this way, this is under grace, so I don't have to worry about it. That person's defiled in their mind. They can claim Christian all they want to. How do, the question is how to advise them. Give them scripture and say, look, this is what the Bible says. It's not me judging you. You don't want me judging you? Fine. Let's let God judge you. Let's see what God says about it and give them scripture. If they accept the scripture, maybe there's hope for them. But my guess is when you give them scripture, it's just going to make them mad. That right there tells you. That ain't right. That ain't right with God. Um, here's a, how do you explain to a fellow Christian who believes in global warming? Again, no such thing. Uh, that we should be stewards of God's earth. Um, I don't know. Number one, God did give us this earth, and we are superintendents of this planet. Okay? Um, that means I don't believe you ought to just throw trash out of your car everywhere. I don't think you ought to dump raw sewage into, some, into your neighbor's creek. Okay? I mean, there's some things that if you stop and think about it that are related to this earth, they're just wrong. Just wrong to do. Okay? And uh, I don't believe in global warming because it's not global warming anymore. Now it's climate change. It'll be global cooling one day, global warming the next. And any time, what the, when the ice flow increases dramatically, north and south pole, and it's so thick that ships can't pass through the water safely, they say, see? Right there. That's what you would expect to see. Is that happening right there? Because no matter what happens, they always point to that and say, that's it. So I don't believe in it. It's junk. It's a money-making, it's an Al Gore money-making scheme. That's what it is, okay? But still, and yet, take care, of you, mow your grass. Trim the weeds out of your garden. Take care. Don't dump nasty stuff all over the place, okay? Take care of the land that you've been given. That's, that's right. That's just being common sense stuff. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, that's global warming, all right. Second, Second Peter chapter 3, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Yeah, and, and believe me, there's a place that's a lot warmer than that, okay? All right, it's 5 o'clock. I'm done. I'm retiring for the evening, okay? I appreciate you all. It's been a wonderful day, amen? Amen, wonderful day. Tell Southern Rays, thank you. Give them big hugs. Tell them you love them. Go to their table and buy all their CDs. And get that latest one. I like that latest one. I like that. Whose idea was that? To whistle in that? It was awesome. Who does the whistling? Okay. You hired a professional whistler? There's a union for that. Okay. But so, those, some of those songs you wrote yourself, right? Okay. And, and anyway, but I, I love these people. Uh, support them if you can. Those of you online, uh, buy, their buy that new CD. It's, it's wonderful. Okay. And the Beethoven's Fifth will be without piano on there. Okay. 
So any, I had fun doing that. Thank you for letting me do that. Because I had fun. We're going to do it again tomorrow, right? All right, let's stand to our feet. Again, uh, try to be here about 9.30. Okay, get in, get settled, and we'll turn Southern Rays loose, and uh, then we'll just have some good... T- Pray for me, because I don't know what to preach tomorrow. Seriously, I don't know. I have an idea. All right. So let's pray for me that God will uh, give us all a rest tonight, and we'll come back tomorrow. And uh, man, it's kind of a bummer, like homecomings. We've only got one day left now. And so anyway, but I've enjoyed visiting with everybody and seeing some of you again. And I just want to tell you I love you, all right? And I thank God for you. You've made you people have made my life worth living. You have. This church and you people, um, you saved my life. You did. Okay? And I thank you for it. I thank God for it. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for what you've done in my life and my family and in this church, the people of this church. Lord, I've been here a long time, and I know what was in the heart of the people, Lord, who put this church together. I know they wanted to promote the gospel. I know they wanted to promote the word. And I know that they wanted right ways in people's lives and hearts. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for that vision, that that mission, that goal. Father, I pray, God, that you would allow those of us in this church now, today, to continue that vision of promoting the gospel, uplifting and magnifying the word, and teaching people that there's a right way to live. Father, bless uh, this day, bless the word that's gone forth into all of our hearts, teach us some new things with it, Uh, stir up in our hearts, Lord, things we already knew, give us revival, give us hope, give us joy. And Father, Lord, when you bring the cloud over the land next time, We'll know what to expect. We'll know, Lord, that you're going to be there in it for us. Because you said you'd never leave us or forsake us. Lord, give us rest tonight. Bring us back safely tomorrow. We love you in Jesus' name.